I'm here with Ian Tisdale who is chairman of Tatra Register UK with his 1938 Type 97 which I understand is the only example in the UK? I believe it to be so. Not everybody joins a club and not everybody makes their uh, plans public but uh, I believe there's a derelict uh, version elsewhere in the UK. This is the only one that's registered in this country. Up and running, okay. Presumably, like all these Tatras, it's got an air-cooled V8 out the back. Well, nearly there, because that's the assumption that pretty well everybody makes, but this particular one, uh, production stopped just before the Second World War, is a smaller version of the car they think that they're looking at. A uh, bit of a giveaway with the two glass windows here because they, they many people who've paid some attention to Tatra um, will be familiar with a similar looking car with louvers that go all down the back instead of windows. This is a smaller car um, made with numerous uh, shared body parts and mechanical parts but if I open the lid you can glimpse um, what, rather than a, um, a big V8, here we've got quite a large flat four. It's a boxer engine. Astonishingly, it's got overhead cams on the heads on either side, so it only just fits into the car, but it is air-cooled. The sharing of mechanical parts was made possible by the fact that um, an air-cooled engine tends to be plugged together out of five times as many parts as a water-cooled engine. Water-cooled engines tend to have a crankcase and a cylinder block, whereas all the cylinders, everything's separate in this. So many of the parts that can be found in the V8 engine that people expect were actually used in this flat four. The, um, the pistons, con rods, etc, etc. Even this cooling fan here, of which we only have one for this engine, um, the V shape of the large car's engine has one of these mirror image on either side underneath the banks. Um, the engine's made of um, electron, which is a magnesium um, alloy as is the gearbox uh, in front of that bulkhead. Uh, pretty good idea really for a rear engine car um, because the engine, this engine is only half the length of the V8, it's only half the weight, um, the magnesium makes it even lighter but then because everything doesn't always go quite logically having come up with uh, a lightweight short engine uh, a lightweight gearbox casing uh, all a good a good idea in a rear engine car to keep the tail weight down inexplicably we have this enormous engine cover which is while being one of the car's delightful features seems a bit illogical because um, it weighs three times as much as it needs to. It's made of nearly eight sheets of steel I think with two pieces of glass and some fittings. Look how it overlaps the, um, the bodywork. Huge overlap. Wouldn't it be better to hinge it here? Well there is actually a reason why this big um, engine cover at some cost in weight um, is provided and that is Apart from the fact that this has glass windows and the large V8 cars have a characteristic row of louvers on either side of the fin, um, this actually is the same component. The engine cover would fit on a large car, it wouldn't be satisfactory because it wouldn't ventilate properly, different shaped engine. Likewise, the front bonnet, um, even though it, it doesn't have a light in the middle, a headlamp in the middle, um, it's the same bonnet um, as on the large car. So much of these car these two large and small rear engine Tatra streamliners is shared. Um, they're modular cars, a bit like... Ma Just like Volkswagen, constantly sharing across its brands. <laughs> and here was Tatra doing it decades before. Indeed, indeed. It's Why, a very logical... Bearing in mind how forward-thinking Tatra was with the streamlined designs of its cars, why isn't there more aluminium used in the construction? Because if this was aluminium, it wouldn't really be a problem so much with its size, I, would it? I've often wondered that myself, and I, 
I have an idea that um, that that during the development life of these streamliners, earlier prototypes may well have incorporated some aluminium, which is what what we might expect. Was it a cost consideration? I don't know. Uh, after the war. Um, all these had been made by that time, but after the Second World War, um, aluminium was what three times as expensive as steel. Right. Um, and then it may be that the shapes concerned may not have been stable and and um, and safe if made out of softer aluminium. This is quite. This is pretty floppy as it yes. is because it only it only pivots on one bolt yes. at, the, at the back. It's a good question, and uh, in in the same way that I find this a bit illogical, I've I've wondered to myself why there wasn't more uh, aluminium in these cars. So you say they were all made by the war, by the time the war started. How many were made? It's some the records tend to suggest that either 508 or 510 were made, um, and one car was assembled. I believe after the war, um, the, the decision was swiftly taken not to build, not to start the build of such a complicated car as this at that point, uh, and the idea was swiftly abandoned. And a similar looking car called the Tatraplan T600 was developed instead. Um, that car solved some of the problems. Uh, that might be perceived on this. It's a simpler engine, but larger. Um, and, and how big is the engine in this? What displacement? This, this is uh, this is a 70, over 1700 uh, cc engine. So 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 people expect it to be smaller than that. But then. This was no people's car. Um, the, the, it may, it may, to some people, resemble the archetypal people's car. But actually, this was a semi-handmade car. Um, it was it, it, its its target audience were it, it was uh, sort of quite well-off middle-class families in what was then Czechoslovakia. It cost nearly six times as much as the German Volkswagen was planned to cost. So um, it's interesting to see much of the advertising in period showed ladies in charge of the car, often a lady driver, a lady passenger, and I reckon that it was deemed to be uh, a suitable second car for quite a well-heeled family. Um, and would they have had one of the big attachments as their main car maybe? Who knows? They quite possible, but um, but the, the, if if the lady of the house had something this unusual, she may have wanted to be the individual of the household. I don't know. So I said about maybe uh, the main car being a bigger Tatra. Am I right in thinking that those V8 Tatras were only available to government officials? That's something we hear. Not at this point. That's a good part of the Tatra story. Yes. But you must remember that the First Republic of Czechoslovakia uh, only lasted from 1918, at the end of the Second World War, to 1939. It was not a, a communist country. Communism came after the Second World War. Right. Okay. So when when we see the the Tatra plan, which looks pretty similar to this, with a simpler but bigger engine, uh, when we look at the T603, which will only have been seen in this country in London at the Czech Embassy, I should imagine, um, and when we see early examples of the last shape of Tatra, the 613, those indeed were not sold uh, to the general public. But this was a the, 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 this was pre-communism, and so the regime was quite different. And the Czechoslovakia of the day was was a very our uh, technologically competent country, uh, the architecture, vehicle engineering, impressive and to a world standard, world class standard. So those days of official reserved cars for the uh, for some that were more equal than others, that was still to come. Okay, uh, so another thing that we hear about these uh, rear-end Tatras is that they're uh, tricky to drive. 
um, and it's very easy to, to lose control of them. Maybe more so than the V8s and the, than the four-cylinder cars. It's, it's, uh, it's, is, is that true? Is that a myth? Well, it's a good and familiar point to raise. Just consider what we've already covered in terms of the large car compared with this car. This one has its air and oil cooled engine which is literally half the length of the V8. But it's still right at the back of the car. But, it, but the, if you think the bit of the V8 that's missing yes. is this bit, okay. it's the back bit, right. which, is, which is more of an issue than this. Yes. Um, so so we, we have a relatively lightweight engine that's only taking up half the space of the V8. And that's an aluminium crankcase? It's it, this is the electron magnesium. Sorry, you did uh, say earlier. Yes. The, um, so, so it's fairly even, lightweight. It's not cast iron. That's right. You've got cast iron cylinders, all individual, um, but, um, but it's not a heavy engine and it's short. So looking at the basic mechanical configuration of a, a boxer uh, rear engine car, presumably this was the inspiration for the Beetle. Well, that's that's uh, the popular myth, um, but. A couple of things are important. The first is the chronology, um, the, the, the the order of events in terms of who designed what um, don't support the idea. Mercedes-Benz were already producing, already selling rear-engine cars of about this size before Ferdinand Porsche began to specifically develop the KDF Wagen. Um, so he didn't really need to copy anybody in Czechoslovakia. Um, it's more important though to say that the great sort of differentiator with what turned into the Beetle was its ability to be produced on a massive scale it was the, the beetle was supposed to was intended to put the german people on the road en masse and so the bodywork was built to the latest standards uh, large panels easily assembled components and so on this is really a handmade car they only made 500 of them anyway they didn't stop making them because uh, the the, uh, the german occupier uh, saw a comp competitor to the Beetle. It was it was stopped because the Prague head office of Tatra had only ever authorised the production of 500 in the first place. Um, and with war uh, kicking off, um, there was a requirement going forward for large, comfortable cars for senior, for senior personnel. Um, if you were going to make a car at that time, in those difficult, challenging times, why make this smaller one? when what was required was uh, was comfortable transport for the important officials. So it, almost everybody assumes that uh, somehow or other Ferdinand Porsche fell to copying Tatra. I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. Fair enough. So the gears would have had synchromesh on top and third, um, but in fact uh, all the gears in that uh, gearbox behind us are about 18 months old <laughs> designed and manufactured in uh, Leicester um, brand new gearbox and we decided not to bother with uh, synchromesh the steering is nice and light not alarmingly so um, the gear change is pretty good uh, you wouldn't really guess that the engine and gearbox were behind, to be perfectly honest. Ste the steering's rack and pinion, um, all-round hydraulic brakes, um, 12 volt. I've got most of the information that I need in front of me. Possibly out of sight is a is a temperature gauge, which. Uh, is reassuring. Once we pass this next bend I'll just give uh, a bit of a flavour of the spirit of the engine because it's a 1700cc engine albeit only four, four cylinders and, uh, and it, is, it is quite a sparky little thing to drive. Doesn't really sound like an 84 year old, does it? And for all its rear engine, um, it's, it feels very reassuring. Not least um, because of the nice high quality 
crossplate tyres that uh, have just been fitted to it, which have made a great, uh, a great improvement to both the feel of it and the comfort. Another thing that's that's been uh, uh, a real good move um, is dismantling and uh, greasing and reassembling the leaf springs front and back because leaf springs really do need to be maintained. The uh, improvement in the suspension is so marked that this little car that used to creak in its bodywork uh, when we first acquired it is now quite silent. The, uh, the springing is much more compliant, much more comfortable, much more effective. The speedo is quite amusing to some people because the needle goes anti-clockwise, which is a nice little novelty touch. You may have noticed that there are a couple of warning lights uh, on the dash um, and uh, it's fair to say that warning lights are generally uh, not good news but the, uh, the status of the lights is rather interesting. The Tatras of this era, I'll just swing around, Tatras of this era actually had an ignition light which, if all was well, stayed on. You can always tell when somebody's uh, writing or recalling a T97 experience uh, when they say, ah, oh, unmistakable Volkswagen sound. You might be able to hear it sounds absolutely nothing like a Volkswagen. It's, uh, it's quite a big, long stroke engine and very smooth. And there isn't any sort of uh, uh, boxer chatter, even though it's a boxer engine.